Well, good morning, Living Oak Church. It is a real joy to be worshiping with you again this morning and to be able to worship with you by studying God's Word. Today we are continuing our study of the Ten Commandments. And the word I want the kids to listen for today is name. It's the word name. We've come to the third commandment regarding the issue of taking the Lord's name in vain. Now you would agree with me that for most people, if not all people, your name is very important to you. Think about it. We don't like it when people get our spelling wrong of our names. We don't like it if people mispronounce our names either. I mean, your parents have done a lot of work of trying to put some thought into what to call you. This week, I googled my name, the meaning of my name. I'm not sure if you've ever done this. Maybe you know the meaning of your name. And I googled it, and it said, my name, Andre, means warrior and brave. Sounds pretty manly, right? <laughs> not sure that's what my parents had in mind when they gave me that name. But I'll take it. Hey. Now, many times when I give my details to someone for the first time and they ask me to spell my name, and my surname specifically, is, they ask me, is it David with one T or two T's? And I emphatically say, it's just the one T. Because that second T can make all the difference, right? I remember I was in primary school and I thought my name and my surname was so unique that no one else would ever have that name. I was the only Andre de Witt that I knew existed until my bubble was burst. This new kid came to our class who joined us from another school and could you believe it? His name was the same as mine, except he had that extra T in his surname. Now, this can present all sorts of challenges because this particular guy, he had quite the reputation as being a troublemaker. His name and reputation was well known by all the teachers and parents very quickly. And it wasn't a good thing. Now, you can imagine, every time there's a sort of situation where this guy is getting into trouble, if people didn't know me personally, they could maybe think I was the one who was the troublemaker. It would bring shame and dishonor to my family. Lying to the teachers, cheating on tests, stealing other kids' stuff, beating on other kids. That's not the kind of reputation to have. And maybe that's the reason why still today I emphatically say my name is Andre with one T. Because I want to protect the honor of my family's name. I mean, there can be all sorts of complications if we don't get someone's name right. Can you imagine two people in the hospital with the same name? The one is there to get his toe fixed and the other day is to have his leg removed. And they somehow mix up uh, the names and when they go for surgery and you come out and the doctor says, wiggle your toe and you can't wiggle your toe because you have no leg. Names are important because they identify us. But the thing is, if names are so important to us, then how much more is that true of God? Because what we will see today is that the third commandment is defending the honor of God's name. Because God's name says so much about who He is and what He has done for His covenant people. This is one of the reasons why God's name is so sacred to Him. It must be sacred to those who worship Him. And we've been talking a lot about worship over the last two Sundays. The first commandment dealt with whom we are to worship. God is the one true God. We are to love and we are to serve Him only. The second commandment dealt with how we are to worship God. We are to worship Him in spirit and in truth. We are not to substitute God for images or ceremonies of our own ideas when it comes to our worship of Him. But we are to worship Him according to what His Word has revealed. But now today we come to study the third commandment which has to do with the name of the one we worship. 
the name of the one we worship. And we want to know why is God's name so important. Because many people perhaps think taking God's name in vain is not such a big deal. We get that we can't worship the wrong God. That we can't have idols. Well, what's the big deal about the name? But there's much more to this commandment that we'll see today. Because there's much more to the God behind that name. So what we want to do today is we want to know how we can honor God's holy name and avoid using His name in such a way that dishonors Him. And to do that, we're going to look at this commandment by asking three questions, three simple questions. First question, why is God's name important? Secondly, how do we dishonor His name? And thirdly, what are the consequences for dishonoring His name? And so firstly, if we're going to honor God's name, then we need to know why is God's name important. Our text in Exodus 20 verse 7 puts it like this. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Last Sunday we spoke about how the invisible God revealed himself to us in his word and through his son. But what we see in the context of Exodus is that God revealed himself through his name. We must understand that in Scripture, there's this close connection between a person's name and his character. I mean, consider what was happening with Moses and God in the burning bush. We all know the story in Exodus chapter 3. Before God even gave the Ten Commandments, God is giving Moses the instruction of what is going to happen regarding Israel's salvation from Egypt. And then Moses asked this question in Exodus 3. Verse 13, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? Well, how did God respond to Moses? Verse 14, God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. You see, the name God revealed was his personal name, Yahweh, or Lord. Capital letters L-O-R-D in your Bible. The same name that we see here, and the third commandment. You see, in Hebrew, it's just those four letters, right? Y-H-W-H. It's the name we try to pronounce as Yahweh. And literally, God's name means, I am who I am. I will be who I will be. Now, just put yourself in Moses' shoes for a moment. God says, tell them my name is I am. Surely Moses was thinking, what does that mean? What does that mean? Because, I mean, that's what we should be thinking. What does that mean? It's like a verb statement which basically says to be. In other words, God is expressing the essence of his character. He is saying that he is self-existing. He is self-sufficient. He is sovereign. And he depends on no one or nothing else. Which is pretty remarkable because no one else in this universe can say that. And as the great events of the Exodus came about, God's name then also testified to his saving power. You see, the Israelites learned from their deliverance that the God who revealed his name to Moses is in fact the God who saves. Now when we use the name of God, we are referring to the essence of his divine being. In other words, this is very, very personal. So when people are talking about God and they take his name in vain and they misuse God's name, whether they know it or not, they are talking about who he is. They are not just talking about a name. But the one who is the substance of that name. In other words, it re represents 
God's entire reputation. Which makes God's name weighty and holy. We see David use this name in Psalm 8 verse 1 when he says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Capital letters, Lord, Yahweh, I am. You see, David was praising God, not just for his name, but because he is the God who made all things for his own glory. In fact, just consider what happens later in Exodus chapter 33. God is meeting with Moses again, and Moses has another request. He wants God to teach him what he should do to continue so that he can please God. And then in verse 18, Moses asked God to show him his glory. Moses wanted to see God's glory glory. And what does God say to him? Exodus 33 verse 19. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim before you my name, the Lord, Yahweh. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy to whom I will show mercy. But he said, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. You see, the thing is, no one could see God's glory and live to tell someone else about it. So what does God do? He tells Moses to stand aside. I'm going to pass by, and I'm going to reveal my glory to you. How? By giving you my name. Declaring his name. Later in chapter 34, we read, The Lord descended into the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. How is God describing himself through his name here? He says, the Lord, the Lord is what? Is merciful slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Through His name, God is revealing to us who He is. Now the thing is, the Bible is actually full of different names for God. And we can grow closer to God by understanding what these names mean. Because God reveals more of Himself through these names. His supreme name is Yahweh, Lord But there are other names given to us in the Bible as well. So I just want to mention a couple for you. So we can enjoy this together as we worship God. The first is Elohim. Elohim. Genesis 1.1. In the opening words of the Bible it says, In the beginning Elohim created the heavens and the earth. That is God. It means creator God. God is the creator. Another is Yahweh Jireh. Which means the Lord will provide. We see this in Genesis 22, verse 14, where God provided the lamb to Abraham by being this replacement sacrifice for Isaac. What about El Shaddai? El Shaddai, which means God Almighty or the Mighty One of Jacob. Genesis 49, verse 24. There's also Yahweh Rapha, the Lord who heals. Exodus 15, 25, it says, I am Jehovah who heals you, both in body and soul. In body, by preserving from any, and curses and diseases, and in soul, by pardoning iniquities. Is Yahweh Nisi. He is my banner. You mean in the old days when, when Israel were, were, were marching against the Melechites, he would have someone that raises up a banner, and they would follow that banner. And this is a whole story about Moses having to keep up the rod so that they can see God is the one who's going to defeat the enemies. Fighting the enemies under this banner, under this protection and guidance of God. One more. Yahweh Makadesh. The Lord who sanctifies and makes holy. Leviticus 20 verse 8. And so already... God reveals to us through these different names 
in different situations, that He is the God of salvation, the Creator God who provides, who is all-powerful, who heals, who leads, who protects, who sanctifies. This is the personal one we know by name, and we worship, and then hear people take His name in vain. And it's maybe because they don't know what they're saying. They don't know what His name means. They make jokes about His name. They vent their frustration in His name. They curse other people with His name. They watch shows where people blaspheme and slander His name. But isn't it ironic that even the unbelieving world, people who have no interest in God, they can't stop using His name in a sinful way. They don't want to submit to Him as Lord. They pretend He's not real. But when they speak, they use His name in all sorts of ways. You see, God revealed His name because He wants us to use it. But He wants us to use it in the right way. God gave us His name so that we would be able to address Him personally. Because by calling His name strengthens our love and relationship with Him. I mean, think about it. Imagine lying in the hospital. I'm lying in the hospital all by myself after having this massive accident. And I hear the nurse say the name of my wife, Caroline. I'm flooded with these affectionate thoughts and emotions because I love her and I want her to be with me. She brings comfort to my heart. How much more is that true of God? Maybe you're going through some physical and spiritual suffering right now. And you, you can draw closer to God. And you can do so by calling on the one who heals. Calling on the one who provides. Calling on the one who protects. Because this is the God whom we truly worship. And we want to honor His name. Because His name reveals who He really is. And what you know about His name reveals what you believe about Him. So if we're going to take the third commandment serious and honor God's name, first we need to know why it's important. What does it mean? Because it reveals to us who He is and how He can be trusted for who He is. And the more we understand how important His name is, how we can see His glory in His name, the more we want to not take it in vain. Which brings us to number two. How do we dishonor His name? What does that look like? Because what does it actually mean to take His name in vain? The Hebrew word translated vain here is, and this commandment means empty or to no good purpose or even worthless. One commentator describes vain here by saying, to take God's name in vain is to treat something holy and sacred as common and secular. To dishonor God's name in a way that it is to denigrate His holiness. It is a way of saying that God Himself is worthless. I want us to feel that for a moment. This is why this command is so serious. Because if people are using God's name in the wrong way, and you act as if God is actually worthy of all of our praises, you're actually saying He's worthless. He's worthless. And so what exactly should we avoid according to this third commandment? Let me mention three things. First, we, sh we shouldn't use God's name with what is false. Don't use God's name with what is false. God is truth and everything about Him is truth. But what people like to do is that they would be lifting up God's name to prove that what they're saying was true. They would swear by God's name, making an oath. I mean, you hear people say this all the time. I swear to God I'm not lying. One of the most obvious examples that we see in the courtroom, right? When people say, I swear to speak the truth, nothing but the truth, so help me God. This person is calling on God to be his witness, which is fine if you are, in fact, speaking the truth. 
But you take God's name in vain when you make an oath like that, but you're actually lying. Maybe you can fool the person in front of you, but you can't fool God. Leviticus 19, 12 says, Do not swear falsely by my name and profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. Think about this in terms of making a vow. Think about a wedding vow. We people make this vow before God and in His name to be faithful to one another. But when they start to look at other people, they start to desire other people and they act on those desires and they're unfaithful to their spouse, essentially they break this vow and they are taking the Lord's name in vain. Because they made this vow in His name. Prophet Hosea said, Hosea 10 verse 4, they utter mere words with empty oaths. They make covenants. So judgment springs up like poisonous weeds in the furrows of the field. What about false prophecies? False prophecies. In the Old Testament, we read again, the prophet said again and again, Thus says the Lord. But how many people still say that today, as if they have some sort of new revelation from God? Using God's name to exercise control and authority over other people. Saying stuff like, God told me to tell you. Because this kind of false prophecy is an attempt to use God's special name and a divine name to advance your own agenda. What about if people just simply say for themselves, the Lord told me to do this. As if he came down from heaven and give you some special revelation apart from his word. We know that God speaks to us through his word. Therefore, we take God's name in vain if we connect it with lies and half truths and what is false. Second, we shouldn't use God's name in a careless or empty way. In other words, God doesn't want us to use his name without thinking about it. I mean, this might be revealed best in the way we pray, right? In fact, Jesus himself talks about this in Matthew 6, verse 7. We know this. When you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think what they will be heard for their many words. And so how often do we hear God's name being thrown in and around in this prayer with, without much consideration of what you're actually saying or who you're actually talking to? Where people care more about what other people think of them than what they're actually praying. That's why Jesus goes on to say how we should pray, right? He starts by directing our thoughts to God's name, Matthew 6, verse 9. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. In other words, let your name be holy. It's weighty. It matters. Maybe this next one is a bit more convicting. I know it's for me because how many of us just throw God's name out there in this quick prayer before we eat so we can get to this meal without actually stopping and thinking who we are talking to? You see, if we stop and slow down, we might notice how casually we think about God's name in so many different ways. And we know people do this in their everyday speech, Right? And a reaction when they don't like something, oh God, no, they would say. When something bad has happened, OMG, can't believe it. One pastor tells of a story where he was sitting on an airplane, hearing these two guys talking behind him. And these guys were using the Lord's name in all these different kinds of ways. I mean, and he finally had enough, so he decided to turn around and ask them, hey, are you guys by any chance in ministry? They looked at him and said, what, make, what would make you think that? Well, he said, well, I'm amazed at your communication skills. You just said God, damn, hell, and Jesus Christ in one sentence. I can get all of that into one sermon. I mean, I'm sure these guys were embarrassed for a while. But has this not become so common in the world that we live in? Jesus said in Matthew 12, verse 34, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So to use 
the name of God or the name of Jesus or the name of Christ as a curse word is evidence of what you think about God. But it's not just that we shouldn't use it in a careless way in how we speak. Because thirdly, we shouldn't use God's name in a hypocritical way either. Using God's name in the wrong way is more than just what you say because it's how you live as well. Think about this with me for a moment. What happens when someone becomes a Christian? You are baptized, right? You are baptized. And you are baptized in the name of the church. No. You are baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In other words, this person is part of a new family. Because now as a child of God by faith in Jesus, you are identifying as a Christian. And since you are a Christian, you bear the very name of Christ. So someone who publicly and privately identifies with Jesus as Lord and Savior, but here's the problem. If you don't live up to that new family name, you are also taking the Lord's name in vain. What do I mean? I mean, if you profess to everyone that I'm a Christian, but you steal from your employer and trying to cut corners, and eventually you're caught and you're fired, and everyone else is like, wow, I thought that guy was a Christian. You're not representing Jesus in the way you should. And therefore, you're taking his name in vain. Think of the royal family in England, you know, when the queen is regarded in such high honor. But if her sons are always on the front cover of the magazine with some new scandal, they drag her name through the mud, which means you can drag God's name through the mud, through the way you live your life. Reminds me of a place where I worked before I was called to the ministry. There was this IT guy that always came to our offices. He was very friendly with the ladies. I mean, I legitimately thought this guy must be single and he's looking for a wife very earnestly. But only later did I find out that this guy has been married for a very long time. He was quick to tell everyone he's a believer. He's a Jesus follower. But he was acting in such a way that it was clear that he brought those dishonor on the name of Jesus. And the thing is, God says, there's consequences to all of this. There's consequences. First, we need to know why God's name is important. Then secondly, we need to know what it means to take his name in vain, to use it falsely, to use it carelessly, and to use it hypocritically. And now thirdly, if we are going to honor God's name, we need to know what are the consequences for dishonoring his name. Exodus says, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. God is saying in the third commandment that he will, be, he will hold accountable those people who don't use his name in the right way. Let's see how serious God takes this because in Leviticus 24, 16, God says, whoever blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him. The sojourner as well as the native, when he blasphemes the name, shall be put to death. Now church, think about this. Is there a more serious consequence than death? You see, if people take God's name in vain today, we don't throw them with stones, do we? What do we do instead? We give them church discipline in love, right? This is where church discipline is so important. But we can see how, clearly see how seriously God takes this. The honor of his name. Because by using his name in vain, you are directly attacking his honor and his glory. You stand guilty before him. No one is guiltless. I'll give you an example of this in the New Testament. This is pretty remarkable, actually. In Acts 19, 11, you have the situation with the the sons of Asiva. Paul is in Ephesus, and not too long after Paul arrived there, he was baptizing people, 
He was going into the synagogues. He was arguing with the Jews about the kingdom of God from the Bible. He was, he was preaching to the Greeks and other places. And, he, and God was allowing Paul to do this amazing work. We read in Acts 19, 11, And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. So that even handkerchiefs and aprons that would touch his skin were carried away to the sick. And their diseases left them and the evil spirits came out of them. Now the thing is, people were starting to notice what was going on with Paul and his ministry here. This specific group of men saw that whenever Paul did something, he did it in the name of Jesus. Whether it was preaching or baptizing or any kind of miracle, Paul did everything in the name of Jesus. And so these guys thought to themselves, hey, there's some sort of power here with this name. If it works for Paul, then it's going to work for us as well. So they had this expectation that if you use God's name, they too can do some powerful things like Paul did. But what happened with these men? Let's read from verse 13, Acts 19, verse 13. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. Now, I mean, they didn't, the Bible doesn't even mention their names because they're representing their father's name here. Notice that. But the evil spirits answered them. This evil spirit answered them. Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them, and overpowered them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. That's amazing, right? God can even use the evil spirit to honor his only holy name. These guys were breaking the third commandment. And there were consequences for it. And this incident became known to everyone. Verse 17. And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks. And fear fell upon them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. We need to fear the name of the Lord in the right way. You see, the name of Jesus is significant. It does have power. Because Jesus is the very embodiment of the name of God. In other words, as we said, God's name was connected to Israel's salvation back in Exodus. And this is true of the name of Jesus as well. When the angel told Mary that she, she will give her baby the name Jesus in Matthew 1.21, it was a name that was given for a reason. Because in Greek, the name Jesus comes from the name Yehoshua, which is like Joshua in the Old Testament, which means what? Yahweh is salvation. So the name Jesus is significant because Jesus is what the prophet Isaiah said he will be. He is Emmanuel, God with us. And the connection between the name of God and the name of Christ becomes clear if we think about Peter's sermon in Pentecost in Acts 2. Where he's quoting from the prophet Joel, Joel 2.32. You see, in Acts 2.21, Peter said, And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You see, in the original context in Joel, it says, Whoever shall call on the name of the Lord Yahweh shall be delivered. So what's Peter doing? Peter is quoting Joel here, and he's directing his audience to Jesus Christ, saying that to call on the name of Yahweh is to call on the name of Jesus. And isn't this the very issue that got Jesus into so much trouble? Because what did he tell people in John 8, 58? Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. I am. What is Jesus saying that made them want to stone him? He was using God's holy name for himself. He is saying, I am self-existent. 
I am self-sufficient. I am sovereign. And I don't need anyone or anything because I am the great I am. And I am the one who came to save you from your guilt. I'm the one who's come to pay the price and take the consequences for dishonoring my holy name. I am the one who has come to keep this commandment for you. I am the one who's come to wash you clean. That's why Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 6, 11, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. And why did the psalmist say he wanted his guilt taken away? Listen to this, Psalm 25, 11. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. For your name's sake. And so you see that God only, doesn't only take away your guilt, He takes away all your sin. If you completely trust in Jesus, if you call upon the name of Jesus. Because here's what we know. Here's what we know. This is what the Bible says. We know, and we all know this, we, we know this verse so well. We know that some people will keep using God's name in vain right up until the day of judgment. Because Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty, mighty works in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. What a shocker this will be for those people on that day. At the final judgment, there will be people who think they know Jesus by name but they're going to be lost forever. Even though they might be calling on his name then, in that moment, God will say, I never knew you. I don't know your name. And the reason is because they were taking God's name in vain all this time, using the Lord's name with, to their own advantage, thinking that this is what makes them right with God. You see, even though it was often on their lips, it was never in their hearts. But that's not all that's going to happen on that last day of judgment, is it? What else is going to happen? The name of Christ will be truly praised like it should be. This is where all of life is going. We are one day closer. We are one Christmas season closer so that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus, God become man, is Lord. Think about it, church. There's a day coming where everyone will be using God's name in the right way. So God makes it clear. His name is important. Because it reveals to us who he is and what he has done. We are not to take his name in vain because there will be consequences for those who do. And as we look at Jesus, we see that those who call on him in faith will be saved. Because he's the one who took our consequences. There is salvation in his name. There is salvation power in his name. And that's why Peter motivates suffering Christians when he says, and, and, and when the world turns around you, 1 Peter 4, verse 14, if you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. If you are insulted for standing up against those who insult the name of God, be happy. It's proof that his spirit is at work in your life. Is that true or do you sound like the rest of the world? As we think about some of the application here, we want to think about how we can honor God's name by using it in the right way. God wants us to use his name, but he wants us to use it in the right way. And we actually see in the Bible there are many ways we can worship God better because of understanding his name. As we said, 
God gave us his name so that we can address him personally. Because as we do, it helps us to grow in a relationship with him. Proverbs 18.10 says it like this. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. A righteous man runs to it and is safe. God wants you to run to his name. What does that mean? It means that when life is tough and you feel you, you can't cope with all its demands, you run to the God and remember his name that he is the Lord who provides. He provided the land for Abraham and he provided the land for us and his son. And you run to that truth and you hide in that truth knowing that he is faithful to his own name. I mean, the Psalms, they, they show us how to honor God's name and the way we praise him. Too, many, too often people throw around the words, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. But they don't mean what they're saying. The psalmist shows us, he says, Psalm 29, 2, ascribe to the Lord the glory due to his name. Sing the glory of his name. Make his praises glorious. Psalm 66, 2. Praise be to his glorious name forever. Psalm 72, verse 19. Praise the Lord, O my soul, O my inmost being, praise his holy name. Psalm 103, verse 1. You see, by telling us to honor God's name, the third commandment helps us to honor God himself. Giving him the same reverence and respect and awe that belongs to his holy name. We also honor God's name when we make an oath and we keep it. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. When we talk to people about him from his word. When we live genuine, God-fearing, Christ-centered lives that faithfully represent the family name in this world. As one man says, the Apostle Paul gave perhaps the, the fullest and most positive statement of this command in his letter to the Colossians. In Colossians 3.17. We all know this one. We should memorize this one. And whatever you do, whether in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So as we've seen from these first three commandments, God does not want us to be careless in our worship. The church and his people are to be in awe of him and who he is. Trembling at his majesty. So let me ask you, are you? Are you? Because all that gets lost when people start to talk and live in ways that show they do not honor his name. So let us respond to this message by defending the honor of God's name through our lives and through our worship of Him by using His name in the right way and recognizing that if God was not so serious about His name, listen church, if God was not so serious about His name, then we would not have true salvation. Because salvation comes by a name, and that is the name that is above every name. If you make His name cheap, you make salvation cheap. Let us worship him for who he is. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much that we can approach you through your son, Jesus. You are the almighty I am. You are Elohim. You are El Shaddai. You are Yahweh. Father, forgive us for how we've taken your name lightly in this world. Forgive us for how we have done it with our mouths. Forgive us how we've done it with our lives. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you that there's true salvation in the name of Jesus. And that Jesus changes everything about us. That we are given the new family name by faith in Christ. Father, I pray if there's anyone here today that does not know you like this, that doesn't know how majestic you are, how holy your name really is, that they would turn to Jesus. As he was hanging on the cross and dying and people 
scoffed him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, and making fun of him. Lord, we know people still do that today. But that is our Savior, the one whom we now represent by faith. So help us to take serious this third commandment. Help us to live in awe and reverence of who you really are. And may you draw people to yourself because of it. And we pray this in Jesus' name. In his name alone. Amen. Would you stand with us as we sing and let's praise the name of Jesus. Praise Jesus for who he is and for what he's done. and he's got a job exactly where? Uh, Mandelbilt. Mandelbilt. Okay, at Mandelbilt, which is uh, about an hour outside of Rustenburg, two hours out of Rust, uh, about an hour out of Rustenburg. Okay, so the um, closest church he knows of is 
Central Baptist Church in Rustenburg, Pastor Karabo Msiza, that's a sister church of ours. Uh, Karabo is one of the, the teachers in the ABTC program and uh, just a good faithful brother. And so uh, big commute, but we're, let's be praying that uh, Katleko will be able to make the most of Sundays at least, be able to go through, worship there with the church, spend some time in fellowship, and just have a, a good, refreshing, regular uh, time with that church every Sunday. And of course, um, for the start of a new job. So, um, brother, we love you. We're going to miss you. And uh, let me pray for you. Okay. Lord, thank you so much for Katleko. Thank you for all that you've uh, done in him in his time here. It really, it's actually very, very clear how you've grown him in his time here at this church. And uh, Lord, what a blessing that is to be a part of. What a blessing that is to observe. You are a faithful God and you make us more and more like your son. You, you complete the work that you begin. And uh, Lord, we, we've seen Katlechel's progress in Christ-likeness and we pray that that would continue all the more. Uh, make him like Jesus fully. God, I pray that uh, in light of this sermon today, that Katlechel would carry your name well, that he would represent you well uh, in this, this new environment, this new context he's going to be living in, and, uh, and this new job. Um, Father, help him to, to make the most of his time, uh, to do his work excellently, and uh, Father, help him also to, to navigate the, the, the various uh, hurdles that might be in the way, certainly distance and other complications that might arise. Um, Lord, to, to help him to be faithfully a part of a new church. And God, I pray that you would bless him greatly there. And Lord, as you've used him here also, he's been a blessing at this church. He's been a good and faithful friend to a number of people. He's, he's uh, been very involved. He's been active. He's served. Uh, I pray that you would use him there at Rustenburg Central Baptist as well. And God, we thank you that we can pray all these things because your Holy Spirit is in us and with us. And you are our Father, and you care for your children well. We pray these things in the, in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Yeah. So please make a point of uh, connecting with him. This is his last Sunday with us uh, for a while. Okay. Brothers and sisters, God bless you. Thank you. <laughs>